The stirred tank bioreactor is probably the most used bioreactor in the pharmaceutical industry. So even though you've decided on a stirred tank bioreactor, there's still many, many different choices that you can go for. I am Professor Marlis Peters and I have different playlists on bioreactors and in this short video I'm going to explain to you how you can make sense of all of this and how you can select the optimal stir tank bioreactor for your application. So there's different design choices for these stir tank bioreactors and as I said before these are the most commonly used ones at the moment and they're still kind of the industry standard. The first one you need to think about is what microorganism and I'm working with. And I'm working, for instance, with bacteria that can withstand high shear and that actually need a lot of oxygen. Is this a mammalian cell culture? Are you working with plant cells such as fungi? All of this will influence the choice of your design. Um, and we'll come back to that in, in a bit. Then we need to think about the size. So are you just doing this on pilot size and then are you kind of uh, scaling that up later? And then there's different uh, ways of how you can clean your bioreactor. Well, the easiest in the sense if, if you wouldn't clean it at all, if you use a disposable system. Uh, but there are some limitations to that as well. So the alternatives then is that whether either you autoclave it or whether you clean it in place or you in situ sterilize it. Now, once you've kind of followed that kind of path, that should narrow down the choices that you have. And then besides that, once you've decided on your bioreactor, you also need to decide on the operating mode. Um, so continuous, which is more suitable for if you work, for instance, on the large scale, because the operating costs in total are much lower, or if you're working on a batch or potentially even a fat batch system. Now for this and how you select the right operating mode, I also have a separate video on how you can see which process is more suited towards which operating mode. So we talked about stirred tank bioreactors, but probably the most common one of those is still the continuous stirred tank reactor. And continuous has several advantages. So this is ideal for a large scale application. It's very easy to operate when it's under steady state and then you can operate it for a very prolonged period of time. It's easy to clean as well and it allows for very efficient gas transfer. Now there are some disadvantages in general of this approach. Um, so foaming is always considered a major issue. So one of the standard sensors that you will need to have is you will need to have like an on off sensor where you look at foaming that's occurring uh, and then add like an anti-foaming agent if that does occur to go against this. It can lead to high power consumptions as well because you're continuously agitating this and there are some limitations in terms of how you can go uh, for the weight and the motor size. So for very high volume applications such as for instance if you work with wastewater treatment there are perhaps some other reactors that are more suitable. But here you can generally see what this setup looks like. Uh, so you will see you'll have, because it's continuous, we always have things coming in, we always have things coming out. Uh, then you might have a sparger on the bottom if you work with an aerated system. You would have some impellers that uh, create the movement that you need in order to facilitate the transfer between the gas and the vitamins and everything that you have in your mixture. If this is a bigger reactor, uh, you might have like a multi-stage uh, system where you have multiple impellers to make sure that the mixing is sufficient. Um, you might have a cooling jacket and there's always a couple of different sensors that you're going to use. And also importantly, what you see here is that these reactors are never filled to the top, typically only till about around 70%. Uh, and you need that headspace because as I said, the foaming can be a real issue. So this is your typical design. Let's have a look at what types of uh, stir tank uh, reactors you have, breaking it down into different applications. Now, and this mainly comes back to the fact that uh, you would see the first two really relate to what type of or or microorganism you're working with. So if you work with a microbial bioreactor and a fermenter, uh, the conditions are very different. So in this case, you typically have a very high uh, high to diameter ratio because that will allow for more efficient gas transfer and here particularly the anti-foaming system becomes really really important. Now what you can see is there's also different impellers associated with this and some of these impellers generate much higher shear which you will need to facilitate high gas transfer whereas other ones such as for instance your marine impeller um, they need less energy input in order to facilitate the mixing. Uh, so these are for instance more suitable for if you have like a very gentle cell culture system where you can't uh, tolerate necessarily that much shear. 
Now the second application, so we went from microbial bioreactor, uh, is then looking at cell culture systems. And here you have exactly the opposite conditions. And the reason for this is that these uh, cells they don't actually have a cell wall, so they don't really tolerate anything related to high shear that well. They also grow a lot slower compared to, for instance, microbial culture. So if you have E. coli, it doubles every 15 to 20 minutes. So very different conditions. So you want actually really gentle low speed mixing and your gas transfer can be a lot lower compared to the microbial bioreactors uh, because the energy demand or the demand for the oxygen is much lower because they don't really grow that fast. However, what you will need to do, you will need to have a very precise control over the oxygen uh, because they will be much more sensitive to that. And generally, you would also have different ways of how you would control the pH. So these mammalian cell culture systems are very sensitive to pH. So normally you would have like an acid base feedback system and a microbial bioreactor. Um, but uh, for instance, here it's much more common to use carbon dioxide to regulate this. Then there's also the option, so this was distinguished between what type of microorganism you're working with. Um, you have these single use bioreactors. And obviously this can be used because they are pre-sterilized. So you do avoid contamination and it is quite flexible. So if you wanted to make different products, then you can very easily rapidly switch between them. But the problems here is obviously this is less customizable. So if you need very specific requirements, you can't do this. And there's less sensor options available. So it might be harder to actually monitor your system. So generally this is probably done on a much lower scale. Therefore, so finally, we have the bioreactors for very specific applications. So we had the bacteria, uh, we have cell cultures, and here you mainly look at algae and fungi, so plant cells. So again, these have very different requirements in terms of when it comes to the mixing and shear conditions. And it was also a little bit different, mainly for one and two, we consider that we work mainly in aerobic systems. But obviously we also have non-aerobic bacteria where you don't need a sparger and there the system can already be quite different. So overall, if I wanted to summarize this, what should you consider? So the first thing, so as you can see that in the diagram, you always need to have a look at is know what organism you're working with. So once you know that, you also need to know the requirements that it has. So basically I've broken it down here between bacteria, fungi and cells. Uh, but uh, basically it's a microbial system, you have animal cells and then you have plant cells and potentially you might also be looking at things like enzymes. So whatever you're working with, I will have different conditions in terms of whether it needs, um, first of all, whether it needs aeration. So do you need to sparge in oxygen? Uh, what kind of shear rates can you use? So what can the cells tolerate? What do they need? And then you need to look at the gas transfer. Now, the second step is then to consider the volume and the productivity that you need. Uh, so how big do we need to go in terms of the scaling? And once we know this, then you need to select the operating mode that you're going to use. So continuous batch or fat batch. And we can always consider single use options for like particularly in, the, in the smaller scale because they're pre-sterilized. So it might be an easy option to start with. And then finally, we always need to consider some specific adaptations because certain systems, they have very specific requirements. Now here also kind of comes into play. Do we really need to have a stirred tank bioreactor or is it becoming so specific that we might need another type of reactor? And within, particularly within this playlist, I have a lot of these other uh, bioreactors listed, such as for instance, airlift reactors and perfusion bioreactors. And I'll talk about in which cases these are actually more suitable. So once you've gone through all of this, you can set up a user requirement specification and you can look at what critical process parameters there are. So what you would need to control. So in general, follow this flowchart and hopefully it should guide you towards the right stir tank bioreactor uh, that you need to use for your system. If you're interested in bioreactors in general in the pharmaceutical industry, then do have a look at some of these other videos in this playlist. Thanks for watching.